All right, welcome back. Um, my name is Jim DiCarlo. I want to thank Tommy and Lorenzo for giving me the chance to introduce speakers today and organize the session on learning invariances and hierarchies. I won't waste time here introducing folks, but for the first speaker, we have Jan LeCun. Jan is at NYU. He's a computer scientist. He's well known for his work in optical character recognition. I know him best for all his work in convolutional networks. I think he'll tell us about uh, deep learning and uh, hopefully its role in um, vision and other things. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I want to talk about, yeah, of course you'll hear about conventional nets, but uh, I want to talk about learning invariant feature hierarchies, uh, which is, you know, a topic that a lot of people have been alluding to in the, in the yeah. last uh, day and a half. John, is yes. the mic on? Oh, I'm so sorry, I, sure. I forgot to turn it on. It should be on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, much better now. So, you know, back 55 years ago or so, uh, Pattern recognition started with people extracting features by hand and then uh, you know, sticking a trainable classifier on top. This is really the first uh, model of, of pattern recognition. And that's, that's, uh, that's the feature extractor right here of the perceptron in uh, 1957 or 58, whatever. Uh, spaghetti plate, uh, as a usually joke, uh, now we've replaced this with spaghetti code, but it's pretty much the same. Um, and that's the classifier. Each of these little guy here is a weight, uh, basically a potentiometer with a motor on it. Um, so, you know, that's pattern recognition 55 years ago. And it really hasn't changed that much since then. Actually, it's changed a bit. Um, modern systems are a little better than this. They actually have three stages now instead of just two. Uh, handcrafted features, some sort of uh, trainable, unsupervised dimensionality expansion. Uh, in the case of speech recognition with mixture Gaussian, in, in the case of uh, object recognition uh, using k-means and sparse coding, and then perhaps some sort of pooling and then a linear classifier on top. So this is acoustic modeling part, the acoustic modeling part of a speech recognition system. Okay, so we've added one layer in 55 years, 50 years, because that's kind of, is also going out of fashion a little bit. What's coming into fashion is multiple layers, and there's a number of experiments in which People using a deep system with multiple layers, 10, 12 in the case of speech recognition, similar number of layers in the case of object recognition, uh, have gotten really, really good results, much better than what people were getting with this type, this type of model. So the, those red boxes are trained either purely supervised or with a combination of supervised and unsupervised running. Those blue boxes are somewhat unsupervised, and those white boxes are built by hand. Um, so what I mean by hierarchical representation is something like this. So these are visualizations that were uh, uh, produced by uh, my colleague Rob Fergus and his uh, former student Matt Zeller on a large convolutional net trained on the ImageNet dataset. Um, and uh, these are visualizations of particular type of motifs on the input or kind of reconstructions of motifs that happen to maximally activate a particular feature detector at various levels. So their architecture is actually much deeper than this. It's similar to Alex Kuzhevsky's uh, deep conf conf net. And these are the features that are learned at the first level, a subset of them, and then um, you know, the kind of motifs that are detected a couple layers up, and yet a couple more layers up, these are the kind of motifs that are detected that you know, some of the feature detectors like to, to see. And you see kind of an increase in the sort of global character of that feature and the kind of invariance. There's a lot of invariant, invariance in the detectors that are, that are here um, and sort of abstract level of abstraction. Yes. The size increases, of course, because, you know, you it's... This, right? Well, uh, you know, uh, the, the pixels are just a lot smaller here than they are here, and then they are here, okay? Here, that's 11 by 11, and that's about three times that, and that's about 10 times that or something. Ah, right, okay, so this kind of hierarchy, of course, exists not just for images, but also for all kinds of uh, natural signals, uh, language, text, uh, speech, etc. And, you know, really the problem of learning uh, representations um, uh, is, is, is not a problem that just machine learning people, computer vision people should be interested in. It's really a general problem for neuroscience, cognitive science. How do we learn representations? I think it's a very, very broad question. What I'm interested in, in figuring out is if there is some sort of simple learning algorithm that would combine with, you know, minor prior knowledge about architectures that would allow systems to develop uh, representations from data. Uh, so, of course, that's all in inspired by the sort of hierarchy, uh, hierarchical nature of the visual cortex and auditory cortex. And, you know, a lot, a lot of us have been inspired by, by this. 
Uh, but before I, I go into the specifics of, of architectures, we can ask the question, what are good features? How do we build good features? So um, I know uh, Stefan is going gonna, is gonna to scream because I'm going to talk about manifolds, but um, uh, <laughs> OK, bad aim, sorry. You're too far. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's no momentum in those balls, you know. Um, right, so, uh, you know, if I ask Stefan to make faces uh, in all possible ways and move his, his head around and I take, you know, I keep taking pictures of him this way, the set of all possible faces he can make uh, lies in a low dimensional uh, nonlinear manifold in the space of uh, all possible images. And the dimension of that manifold is bounded above by the number of independent muscles in his face. So it's something like 50 or so. Uh, you know, so a lot of natural data is going to be of that nature. Either it lies on a manifold or is defined by the fact that it doesn't lie on a manifold. We were just discussing this earlier uh, at lunch. It's not going to look like this beautiful Kalebi Yao thing, but you know, uh, some manifold. So how do we uh, extract, how do we you know, transform data so that we sort of uh, uh, extract features that essentially are things like the position on the manifold of an image we're seeing or the, the coordinates away from, from sort of the relevant uh, manifolds, if you want. And one, one way that a lot of people have been using for a very long time um, is, is the following. You take your, your input, you expand it, you expand its dimension using a nonlinear function, and the role of this nonlinear function is, is to break things apart. So things that are semantically dissimilar would have to be broken apart so that the next layer up would be able to uh, separate things that need to be separated. And you know, it's, it's, it's kind of easier, you know, since uh, cover theorem and all that stuff, we, we know that it's uh, more likely to happen in high dimensional spaces and low dimensional spaces. So this mapping has to be nonlinear. If it's linear, then it's not going to, to uh, disalign points that are aligned, and so it's not doing anything useful for us. And then we follow this by a pooling or aggregation operation, uh, which glues back the pieces that need to be glued back. So, uh, you know, a good example of this is the way people do feature extraction by doing uh, k-means or vector quantization. So you have, you know, the manifold of, of rotated threes, the manifold of rotated eight. Those two things are very close to each other because they have many pixels in common, and so you can't really separate them. So you do k-means, and those two guys are a cluster, and then this guy is a cluster, and those three guys are a cluster, and whatever. And so you build a vector of size k, and then if you show any of these two guys, that component is going to turn on, but not these guys. And you know, each each pattern here is going to activate only one component of this, uh, of this vector represented inside those boxes. And then you have some sort of OR operation that glues back the things that need to be glued, glued together and, uh, and, and you, know, you separate the classes this way. It's a very classical way of doing things, you know, uh, some sort of expansion, nonlinear expansion, followed by linear uh, either classification or pooling, depending on your point of view. So it's, it's sort of a good, idea, a good process by which to build um, hierarchies of features. Uh, by, by doing the, the sequence of operations. So the way we're going to build a nonlinear operation is basically a, a linear operation followed by a pointwise nonlinearity. Uh, so k-means doesn't work this way. It's actually not a pointwise nonlinearity. It's a winner-take-all. But uh, here we're going to use a pointwise nonlinearity just to simplify. Uh, we precede this by, perhaps by some sort of normalization, although that's not always necessary. And then some sort of pooling, which may be either learned or, or built by hand. In the case of ConNet, it's, it's built by hand. And then we're going to repeat this stage multiple times, stick a classifier on top, which is really no different from, from this, you know, from the first uh, three stages, um, and, and train that somehow, with, perhaps with a combination of uh, unsupervised and supervised learning. Um, and so ConvNets are an example of, 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 of this kind of architecture, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. So um, you, uh, you take an image, you uh, pass, a, you convolve it with a filter, you get some response, you pass it through a nonlinear function of some kind. Um, so here is the image, here are the results of applying four different filters to this image. Then you pool, and the pooling is spatial in that case, so we, you, you do a, a max or an average or LP norm of uh, a little chunk of, uh, local chunk of data, and then you subsample this by a factor of two. So the pixels here are twice as big as, other, as the pixels there. Um, so you reduce the resolution by a factor of two here in each dimension, and then you, do the, you repeat the process. So each of these guys is a result of applying uh, different filters to each of those guys. You add up the result, pass that to a nonlinearity, and pool again. Uh, and then you know, here there is just a simple linear classifier. Uh, so those things have been around for a long time, um, trained the, you know, with backprop and things like this since the late 80s. Uh, in fact, there's an earlier paper in 1988 
uh, where I build this and you know train them with with backprop. But of course, the idea goes back a long a long time. The basic idea of those uh, you know local feature detection that are replicated uh, with some nonlinearity and feature pooling is really based on the simple side complex L idea from Huber and Wiesel in the 60s, and uh, the sort of inspiring work of uh, Fukushima with the cognitron in the uh, in the 80s, uh, neo cognitron particularly in the 80s. Well, you had this idea of kind of stacking, uh, you know, replicated filters with pooling, um, pooling layers. What he didn't have was backprop. So he had to kind of devise some complicated unsupervised learning algorithm. Um, so those things work really well when you train them supervised. And, and supervised learning is really uh, uh, very simple to do with, with uh, backprop to compute the gradient. So you propagate forward, compute the error, backpropagate the gradient, update the weights. And every filter in every layer is updated simultaneously using backprop. Nothing magical about this. We've known how to do this for 25 years. Um, and we've known about chain rule for a lot longer than that. So, um, right, so they, you, know, you can apply those things to all kinds of different things, w w different applications, which is what, what people have done. And uh, this is a kind of an old ConvNet uh, that I trained you know, 20 years ago or so. Uh, and what I, what I want to show here is the sort of flattening, manifold flattening properties of this. Of course, this was trained entirely supervised, so there is no uh, particular property that we impose on the system other than that you know, the, the last layer of feature should be digestible by the linear classifier that's on top. So you take one pixel here, it goes from white to black to white, which means, and there's a whole bunch of pixels like this that go from white to black to white, which means that the manifold of translated threes is curved. Um, and you go up the layers, these are the internal states of the various layers. You go to this stage here, uh, so every vertical slice here encodes is a feature vector that represents a 32 by 32 window on the input, and successive vertical slices encode uh, 32 by 32 windows shifted by four pixels. And here you hardly see any value going to, from white to black to white. They all, they all go in one direction, um, which means the manifold is flatter here. I mean, of course, I'm not making a quantitative statement here. It's kind of hand wavy, but, um, but it has to be because the linear classifier that's uh, right next to that works really well. Okay, so those things have been around for a long time and it's interesting that um, when you look at the dominant approaches to object recognition uh, in computer vision uh, until very recently, uh, has converged to the same kind of architecture. So if you look at, so one of the dominant approaches is something based on Lana Zebnik's work uh, from uh, uh, you know, uh, seven years ago or so you have a front end which extracts SIF uh, features, and SIF features are really filter banks on linearity and pooling with some normalization thrown in. Hog is pretty much the same idea. Dense features uh, extracted over the entire image uh, with pooling. Uh, that's what the histogram part is, is really pooling. Uh, then the second stage is this sort of unsupervised uh, sparse coding or k-means or uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, other types of kind of sparse encoding of data, uh, followed by pooling again. So here you, you could think of this as a filter bank with a winner-take-all type nonlinearity in the case of k-means and a slightly more complicated nonlinearity in the case of sparse coding, and then uh, uh, feature pooling, and then you stick your favorite classifier on top, SVM, multinomial logistic regression, whatever. So this was kind of a pretty much a dominant approach to object recognition until last year. Um, No, actually, there was a lot of different ways people were doing visions before, like, you know, as Pietro. So, you know, a few years before, people were doing this with sparse features, with interest point detection. And then you extract, you know, C features there, and then you do a bag, you're which is not dense. I see. So you're saying that the key, key difference is that, that if you're, it's the whole image. You do dense, right. It's, dense, right? it's a dense thing, and then the fact that you have two stages and, you know. Um, so, you know, no learning here, unsupervised learning here, supervised learning there. Um, okay, so uh, ConvNets have kind of um, sort of taken over this approach for object recognition, not for every application, but for object recognition at least. And the, the watershed moment was uh, last year's uh, victory by uh, Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya Soskever, and Jeff Hinton of the ImageNet competition. So they used a very deep convolutional net, much deeper than the ones that I've uh, had used before. Uh, using some uh, ideas that uh, uh, we came up with, with in my lab, like local contrast normalization and uh, rectified nonlinearities, and using a trick that uh, Jeff came up with called dropout, which is a sort of a murderous uh, 
regularization trick, which you need for those gigantic, gigantic networks. Um, and what they had uh, that, that nobody else had at the time is a very fast GPU implementation of those systems that allowed them to train on the large ImageNet data set. Uh, and it takes about two weeks to train a network typically. Uh, so it's, it's very heavy computationally for training. Uh, once it's trained, though, it's pretty fast. Um, so it's about a, you know, a little less than a billion uh, multiply as to compute the uh, output from an input. There's about 60 million parameters. And the performance on ImageNet, of course, was dramatically better than the previous approaches, which used slightly more sophisticated things than what I described earlier. Uh, so the best system was about 26%, and the, the, uh, the ConvNet got 15%. This is a, a particular way of measuring classification error. Basically, you count an error if the correct answer is not in the top five proposed by the system. And say again? Uh, this was trained on two GPUs, actually. Just, yeah, in Alex Krzyzewski's bedroom, you know, in a desk side machine. Not, nothing fancy. It, took two week. it takes two weeks, right? And it takes very optimized GPU code to do this. But it's basically just one on two GPUs. I mean, now, now we can do this in 10 days on a single GPU, but. Um, or a little less even. So these are the filters that are learned by the system. There is a, a sort of unnatural uh, separation of uh, luminance and chrominance filters uh, due to the particular architecture that was used uh, um, in other trials. They're kind of more mixed up. And uh, you know, just a few months after these guys won the competition, they were essentially acquired by Google. And uh, within two months of this, Google deployed the image tagging system to, uh, uh, based on this, uh, on this uh, network that works really well. Um, so we've, uh, you know, we've been playing with, with things like this uh, also for quite a, quite a, quite a while, uh, very deep uh, convolutional nets as well. The latest version that we have that we just submitted to the ImageNet competition, the deadline was yesterday, um, uh, we get something like 13.8% error to 5, where Alex Krzyzewski was getting 15%. Uh, this is for an ensemble of seven networks. Uh, for a single network, we get a little uh, over 15%. I think this number actually got better since uh, last time I wrote it down. Alex Krzyzewski was 18.2. Uh, we can do also classification localization simultaneously. There is uh, some measure uh, by which Alex was getting 34% error, we're getting 30%. And uh, detection is a new task. Um, uh, what that means is unclear yet because nobody has really tried this. Uh, we'll, we'll see how well that, that, that works, but you know, what we get is 19%, whatever that means. Yes. Yeah. That would be more or less so the, the one about the second layer. Uh, after the second max pooling is the, the new part, so to say. So usual system where like convolution pooling, convolution pooling is done essentially twice. And this is deeper in that sense. They right. Up. No, I mean, it's not like we never tried to add more layers. It's just that on the data sets that we had before, it, it just didn't, didn't help. And uh, also we were using hyperbolic tangent, and that turned out to be very difficult to train for very deep architectures, those ReLU units. Uh, sort of half-wave rectifi rectification on linearities uh, seem to be working better in deep deep systems. Um, so yeah. Uh, so if you count all the pooling, uh, yeah. So it had convolution pooling, convolution pooling, convolution, uh, one by one convolution or, or full connect, and then another full connect for the classifier. So that's seven layers. Yeah. And this one is more like uh, ten or twelve. 11. <laughs> yes. So the, this number, the, the number you're showing, so in ImageNet, the test set is available? Or is this is validation. This is validation. We'll know about the test set in a few days, I suppose. Uh, so yeah, there is no gain control? Or normalization. No, there's no gain control, no normalization. Yeah. You didn't find it useful? Uh, we found it useful for when we trained on Caltech 101. That made a huge difference. Uh, Alex Krzyzewski has some sort of normalization in his, in his network. Um, where is it? Here. He has contrast normalization. Uh, it's a different form than the ones we use, but uh, uh, and he, he says that that got him a you know a couple percent better. But we we don't have one. You know, we, 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 the thing is, we're going to play with this quite extensively over the next uh, you know few months and figure out which of those hacks really matter in, in, the, in, the, in the case of very large data sets. It's very difficult to make those experiments because one training session takes 10 days so, or two weeks. So you, know, you need a, a rack full, a room full of GPUs, and we're building that, but we don't have it yet. Do a GPU now. Which is 
too expensive. It's too expensive. <laughs> it's cheaper to just buy your own. Um, so these are the kind of, so this is with seven by seven filters. Uh, this is the kind of filters that are trained. Uh, this is for 11 by 11 filters. They look very similar to the ones Alex uh, obtains. So th again, this is purely supervised. There's no sparsity, whatever. You know, it's just purely supervised backprop. And these are the filters you get. And they seem to be uh, separated between luminance-based filters and sort of chrominance low-frequency type filters. Um, okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is, since we were talking about balls, is show you a live demo of that system. All right, so I've got a webcam here, which I can point at various things. And it's been trained on ImageNet. Um, so it knows that's a handheld computer. And it's a nipple <laughs> or a water bottle. OK, so I don't know if it knows about short water bottle. We'll see. Water bottle. If I blur it, it says nipple, I think. Um, I'm not sure this works. Nail. Later, OK. Uh, it should say ballpoint pen, but OK, ballpoint pen, if I bring it closer, maybe it does. Uh, Can you turn the camera upside down? Is that OK? I don't think so. I mean, for the bottles, yes. Uh, for this, of course not, but that's a zero telephone. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, let's try that. Microphone, OK. Uh, bagel, OK, it's not a bagel. It's a cookie, but I think it doesn't know about cookie. Uh, dough, that's actually correct. Envelope, this is, okay. Hesitate between envelope and napkins, which I think must keep on it. No, give me a break. <laughs> Paper towel, that's correct. Uh, okay. Uh, that's, that sucks. Yeah, it sucks pretty bad here. I'm not sure what's going on. Wine bottle, I'm not sure where, where, where it sees a wine bottle. Okay, how about that? Shopping basket, that's about right. Backpack, that's about right. Folding chair, that's, you know, it's not folding, but it doesn't actually have the chair category, so. Um, and let's see, how about this? <clears throat> Buckle. Holster, loafer, okay, that's more, more correct. Although it's got, it's got low score somehow. Loafer. Uh, monitor. I'm not sure what it's, it'll say with this. Cinema. Balance bars. No, no balance bars. Parallel bars. That's funny. Uh, OK. Cinema is, is, looks more correct, but it's, it's not very high score. OK, so you get the idea, right? Uh, I'm not sure it knows about this. We'll try. Check a lantern. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Spotlight, OK, is number two. I'll, I'll take that as a, a declare victory. Say again? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, if I point it at itself, it says laptop. If I bring it closer to the keyboard, it says keyboard or space bar. So it knows its own body. Um, all right. So this is running on the, I have this huge laptop here because it's got, uh, you know, NVIDIA 680M um, GPU. Let's see. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is a different version of this demo, which is slightly more funny. Because this one I can train. So uh, this is a relatively low resolution screen. OK, so this one I can point the camera anywhere and uh, click on one of the learn buttons, and it will learn the corresponding category. So what, what's going on here is that it's the same network. I just chop off the last layer. And every time I click on the learn button, it, uh, it stores a template of the uh, state of the last, you know, the last layer of features, basically the second last layer before the classifier, uh, and uses a, essentially what amounts to a nearest neighbor classifier. So let me point it at this table here, and I click learn a couple times. The number that you see here is the number of times I click learn, so it's the number of templates. So if I point the ca camera someplace else, it says low score, put back here, 
he says that. Let me increase the gain a little bit here. Uh, I can point it at Tommy, who is uh, not paying attention. And that's good. <laughs> uh, but he saw this before, like a few weeks ago. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to avenge him on myself. All right, so it knows about me. It knows about Tommy. Uh, of course, I'm afraid that if someone else were, were to sit here, it would still say Tommy, uh, because it recognizes really the, it's a gestalt of the entire you know, background. So you, know, you get the idea. I can, I can train this with a very small number of, of samples uh, very quickly, and that's because the features of the last layer are, are really kind of somewhat invariant. Already, they figured out what invariance really means for vision. I mean, for you know, to some extent, we can't say for sure the degree of invariance there is in, the, in these features, but you know, there is some degree at least. Um, okay, this is running on GPU. Yeah, six eighty M. It's so it runs at about two and a half frames per second. This demo runs about two and a half frames per second on the CPU, and about uh, eight frames per second on the GPU. Well, that includes the GUI and everything, right? Display, grabbing. Uh, so more recently, we've uh, applied this to uh, localization and detection. Uh, this is for the ImageNet competition that we just submitted. So this works pretty well. You know, Granny Smith, Strawberry, um, Rabbit, whatever. So this is an interesting mistake here. Um, okay, so it says this is a, a cheetah. It's actually a lion, but okay. Samoyed, that's an obscure breed of dogs, longer. But this one here is funny. It's a zebra. <laughs> And then instead of, see, of seeing a lion here, it kind of confuses the combination of a lion and a zebra and says tiger. Um, so there's a bit of a you know, feature binding problem there. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, when it knows about lots of categories. Uh, this is a, a more recent version of that system that ha actually computes accurate loca loca locations of bounding boxes. So uh, you know, this is uh, Mayo, which means the leotard or whatever it's called. <laughs> Two guitars are detected, two monkeys, cars, birds, oboe. That's a mistake. That's not a remote control. Um, OK, let me skip ahead, because I want to talk a bit about unsupervised learning. Um, or about, about something else, actually, not just unsupervised learning, <laughs> about uh, applications of this. So we can take this script that we use to train our um, object recognizer, and essentially, with very minor changes like you know number of feature maps and filters and whatever, train it on speech recognition. So take a speech signal, do a time frequency representation of the speech signal, then stack a uh, convnet, which is essentially the same, you know, very similar to the one I just showed you, except the input is smaller and you know the pooling only takes place over, over frequency and not over time and blah blah blah. But other than that it's pretty much the same, same number of parameters more or less. And you get really good performance on subphone classification error, which is, you know, uh, here is a segment of speech. Tell me which state of the HMM is the most likely at this time, essentially. Uh, so we're working on this with uh, IBM, and they, they have previous deep learning system, uh, not convolutional, that had 37.8% error on this, and we get 336 um, And, you know, the inputs look like images, and the filters look like this. They are not Gabor filters, but... Um, but they, they, you know, many of them detect motion of spectral lines, uh, which is sort of interesting. Um, a more interesting application we've worked on is uh, things like uh, uh, image uh, segmentation or, or semantic segmentation, where you label the, every pixel in the, in the image with the category of the object it belongs to. And uh, we use a multi-scale uh, convnet for that purpose to, to get a lot of context for, for classifying every pixel. But basically, you could think of this convnet as not one where you feed an image and it gives you a classification for the entire image, but it gives you a, a, a category for the central pixel in that window, and then you shift that window over the entire image. But in fact, when you put all of those convnets shifted all together, it's just like a bigger convnet where the output is itself convolutional. So it's very cheap to do this with convnets. And, uh, and we feed the, you know, we have three uh, copies of this convnet with the same weights they share weight across, across uh, scale, and we feed it with three scales of the image uh, concatenate the, the features and then train the whole thing with backprop and it basically performs at uh, you know above state of the art so something like you know by one measure of performance the best competing system is 72.4 uh, percent we get 74.5 uh, 
Uh, this is uh, what's called crash normalized uh, accuracy. And furthermore, our system is about 100 times faster than the best computing system. Um, this is a, another data set. This is a CLUT uh, uh, data set, the CFLOW data set. Again, we, uh, our system is much better than the best uh, competing system. Yeah. It's not for smoothing, it's for unsmoothing. It's for lining up the uh, responses. It's for sharpening the, uh, the response so that the responses line up with the edges in the image. It's a very, very simple post-processing. It's just majority vote over super pixels. So that works really well. Uh, as you'll see in a second in the video. Um, I mean, there are stupid mistakes that this system makes, but, uh, but it, it, you know, it's as good as it gets. Uh, you can apply this to depth images as well. Uh, you can do uh, temporal consistency to kind of correct some of the mistakes. So the bottom version here uses uh, essentially what amounts to spatial temporal superpixels. Uh, and it corrects some of the mistakes. And then you can apply this to depth images, uh, indoor images, and it works pretty well as well. Uh, and of course, there are sort of deployed applications of this. But let me, um, let me talk a bit, let me skip ahead and talk about unsupervised learning. So, uh, because that's kind of the topic that people were talking about earlier today. And, uh, you know, what, it, what, it, what does it mean to really, so one thing that we've done in the past is used unsupervised pre-training followed by uh, supervised fine-tuning to train those networks. And we got better results using this technique uh, using unsupervised pre-training as opposed to complete random uh, initialization on a very, very small number of applications where the number of uh, label samples is relatively small and, whether, and when the label set is weak. Uh, an example of this is uh, pedestrian detection. So the question is, how do you do unsupervised pre-training for those systems? And we, uh, the technique that we arrived at is essentially based on sparse autoencoders. So, um, what you want to do when, when you do unsupervised training is capture the, dependency, the dependencies between, uh, between variables that you observe, right? So you have here a two-dimensional vector, and the points that come at you have some structure to them and uh, lie in a low-dimensional uh, 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 manifold of some kind. And you'd like to, uh, you know, if you observe y1, you might like to be able to predict what the distribution over y2 is or, or maybe uh, a choice over possible values of y2. So one way to do this is to train uh, some sort of contrast function or an energy function that takes low values on the observed points and higher values everywhere else. Those are two examples of such energy functions. And if this energy function you know, has the right shape, then it has somehow capt captured the dependencies of the internal structure of the data. These are two different architectures and learning algorithms to, to learn this kind of dependency. These are not practical. This is for, more for demonstration purpose. So here we have kind of a rigid energy function we pull down, we just push down on the um, energy of the blue, the blue points, which are the data points. And because the energy function is rigid, basically it's a bunch of Vs, um, uh, it has no choice but putting the minima around those points and you get a nicely looking energy function. But here, the energy function is very uh, flexible. It can, it can be flat if you want. And, and in this case, pushing down on the blue beads is not enough. You get a flat energy function. You also have to push up on everything else to make sure that you get a groove around the blue beads. And this is a problem that people working with probabilistic models are very familiar with. It's, uh, it's the term that pushes up on the energy of stuff that's around you uh, or that's outside of data points is the, uh, essentially the log partition function uh, due to the log partition function in maximum likelihood. So basically in unsupervised learning, uh, the main issue is not how to make the energy of the data points low, it's how to make the energy of everything else high. And I've kind of uh, came up with a list of about seven different methods to do this. Um, so the first one is similar to the first example I showed. You build a machine so that the volume of low energy stuff is constant. Basically, you have normalized probabilistic model or something similar to this. But I'm not talking about probabilistic models here. This is just energy-based uh, energy models, so no notion of normalization. Second method is you push down on the energy of data points and push up everywhere else. That's what we call maximum likelihood. Uh, but you need to have a tractable partition function for this to work. And of course, all the interesting models have intractable partition functions, so we're kind of screwed. Uh, so number three is push down on the energy of data points and push up on chosen locations outside of the data points um, so that you know, the thing takes the right shape but somehow is not, uh, uh, thanks, uh, but somehow is not, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, it's not the entire space, right? We, we choose the places we're gonna pull up so that the thing takes the right, space, the, the right shape. And there's a whole bunch of different techniques to do that, that are based on this idea. One is contrastive divergence, which consists in taking one of the data points, then moving away from it in some fashion, preferentially in uh, directions where the energy goes down. 
um, and then taking this point and pushing it up. Okay, so what it does is that it creates a local groove in the energy function that, uh, uh, you know, have it take the right shape. Far away from the, the data point, the energy function takes whatever shape it wants. Um, there's other similar methods, uh, which I'm not going to go through. Uh, number four is minimize the gradient and maximize the curvature of the energy function around data points. So, uh, again, that's the idea of creating a groove, right? So you want the energy function to, be, to have zero gradient on, around data points, and you want it to curl up. So maximize the trace of the Hessian, for example. Uh, that's called score matching. Uh, this is apo uh, uh idea. And it's a very cute idea, except it's completely impractical in, in practice because if the model is a bit complicated, you have to figure out how, you have to figure out the gradient with respect to the parameters of the trace of the Hessian of the energy function. And that's just a big pain in the, you know, whatever. Um, uh, so number five is uh, train a dynamical system so that the dynamics goes to the manifold. So here you forget about energy functions altogether. You're going to train a vector field, which you could interpret perhaps as the, the gradient of an energy function if, it, if its curl is zero. And uh, you train this vector field, so you train a machine so that when you put it, uh, when you give it a vector uh, at some point, it uh, moves you towards the tip of the vector in that vector field, and those, vector, uh, those vectors point towards the manifold of, of, of data. Uh, there's a technique like this called denoising autoencoder that was uh, proposed by uh, Pascal Vincent and Yosha Benjo. Uh, pretty cool method. Uh, so people in Yosha's group are, are using this a lot for various things. And then there's my favorite one. I'm not going to talk about this one, but this one is really my favorite. It's you use a regularizer in the loss function you minimize, or in the energy function, actually. Uh, in such a way that the volume of space that can take low energy is as low as possible. So it's kind of like shrimp, shrink wrapping, if you want. Uh, design your energy function in such a way that um, uh, if, if your system wants to give low energy to uh, data points, um, it can do that. But then the volume of stuff that can take low energy is, is being pushed down by, by this regularizer. So it's like you know, you're trying to shrink wrap the, the data set, if you want. Um, and sparse coding is an example of this, uh, as well as sparse autoencoders, which is uh, the method that we, that we like. Okay, so let me visualize what that means, this energy stuff, right? So that's PCA formulated in terms of an energy model. So PCA here with inputs, you know, two-dimensional inputs and uh, a one-dimension uh, principal uh, subspace. And the, the points are sampled in this, in this uh, little um, uh, spiral here. And PCA finds the principal axis, gives low energy to this uh, thing, and then the uh, energy, which is a reconstruction error, uh, goes quadratically as you move away from the principal subspace. Okay, so it's a terrible model. This is k-means with k equal 20. So k-means puts uh, prototypes all around this little spiral, and the the overall energy is the min over all, uh, you know, every uh, prototype of the square distance to the closest prototype. Right? That's what the min is about the closest prototype. Uh, so here, this is an example of energy function that has a latent variable z here, which is the uh, which prototype you pick. Right? Uh, latent variable in the non-probabilistic meaning of the term. Um, but really, what we're what we're working with is sparse coding. So sparse coding is this idea that you all know, which we've we've heard a, a lot about this morning. Um, you know, basically, the inference algorithm is you have a, a variable z that represents the input y. And the way you compute it is by minimizing a, a, a reconstruction error, say a, a distance measure between a reconstruction of, of y through a decoding function, uh, generally a linear one. Uh, but at the same time, there's a, a factor that limits the, uh, the, say, a sparsity factor, for example, that essentially limits the entropy of the distribution of z, if you want to uh, formulate this in those terms. And this is the term that, lim that th this is the, sh the shrink wrap term. It's the term that limits the volume of stuff that can take low energy, if you want. Um, so more precisely, the sort of L2, L1 sparse coding is, is this, with this kind of energy function, square reconstruction error plus L1 regularization. And the problem with this, of course, is that, so you can learn the dictionary matrix easily using gradient descent, as long as you keep it constrained within a sphere. Uh, it's very simple. We've known this since, uh, it's not 10 years, Guillermo, it's 15 years, 16 years. Uh, you said 10 years, I think. Um, you know, it came from neuroscience, right? Um, and uh, and the inference uh, algorithm consists in doing this minimization. And as Guillermo said, it's kind of expensive to do this because uh, even though there are efficient algorithms to do this, you have to minimize the, 
the combination of those two terms. And so if I give you a, a y that's several hundred dimensions, and I ask you, give me a z that's 1,000 dimensions, that minimizes this, it's going to take you, you know, a few milliseconds. And if you have to do this for every location on an image, you're not going to get a real-time uh, object recognizer. So that's no good. Uh, the energy function you get is something like this. It's a union of low-dimensional linear subspaces, basically. Um, so we had this idea a few years ago to essentially train a feedforward model. So this is what Guillermo was referring to. You train a feedforward model to predict what the solution, uh, what the optimal z is for any particular y. Okay, so, uh, so this is just regular sparse coding. You give a y, you compute the optimal z that minimizes the reconstruction and the sparsity. And now what you have is a pair, uh, y and z, that you can use to train a feedforward uh, a supervised predictor to predict the, this z from, from the y, okay? Think of this as, say, a two-layer neural net or something like that. So basically, you train a neural net to solve an optimization problem. And the cool thing is that you can control the complexity of this so that it doesn't have to cost you an arm and a leg. So a particular example of this is when this encoder here is equal to the product of a matrix by, uh, uh, by the input and then passed through a shrinkage function or half-wave rectification or something like that. Basically, uh, one layer of a convolutional net particularly if you make this convolutional, if you make this linear operation actually a, a filter bank instead of just a matrix. Um, so if you train this on uh, natural image patches, this is the learning algorithm running, and uh, you know, it's only a few thousand samples, so uh, again, if you think about the equivalence of biology, the convergence would take minutes. It's very fast, you get Gibor filters really quickly, um, with just this you know, forward backward thing. Uh, give more light filters than not give more filters. Um, okay, and then later, uh, my postdoc, former postdoc, Carol Greger, had this really cute idea, which uh, uh, Guillermo was referring to. Uh, in fact, he has a few uh, publications about this. Um, is is the, the idea that the algorithm, the inference algorithm for sparse coding, we know what it's supposed to look like. Uh, it's, it's called the ISTA algorithm, iterative shrinkage and thresholding algorithm. And it looks just like this. Uh, you start with Z, uh, z0 equals 0, and then you iterate this uh, little uh, formula here, and eventually z, of, uh, you know, z, uh, z converges towards the optimal sparse code that minimizes the energy for a particular y. And so Carol had the idea of basically building a, a neural net like this, with this architecture, a recurrent neural net, where uh, those matrices which are prescribed uh, will be learned from data. And we're going to truncate the iteration of this with a few iteration, whatever we can afford, and train it to produce the best possible approximation in that number of iterations. Um, so that's kind of the idea. Take this little network, unfold it in time, and now you have a, essentially what amounts to a two or three layer neural net that you can train with backprop to predict the best approximation. And this works amazingly well. You can, you can get really good approximations of the sparse code in just a few iterations. Like with two iterations, you know, you get uh, an error, a reconstruction error here of a you know, particular value. And this is what you get with ISTA. ISTA, you have to wait for a long time before you get the, the solution. Um, so this works really well. Uh, let me skip ahead. Uh, so we had version of this where we combined the reconstruction cost together with a prediction uh, of uh, a category. So you get kind of a supervised, you know, a combination of supervised and unsupervised criteria to train a recognizer. This works really well but I'm, I'm not gonna have time to do this. So, okay, so there are convolutional versions of this where essentially the reconstruction, instead of being a vector that you multiply by a matrix to reconstruct the input, it, you take a bunch of feature maps, like in convolutional net, multiply, uh, convolve them with a bunch of filters, sum them up, and that's your reconstruction. So this is like a, the backward uh, you know, uh, counterpart of the feed-forward uh, part of a convolutional net, if you want. Um, so my colleague, uh, Rob Fergus, um, uh, with Matt Ziller and, and Graham Taylor, build an entire convolutional net based on this, where basically all the arrows are reversed, and you, you know, you call this a deconvolutional net. Um, and that, that kind of worked pretty well. And we used this um, idea of convolutional sparse coding in the context of this little sparse autoencoders to train filters. And what you get is, when you train, the, when you train a sparse, sparse coder at the patch level, you get those, uh, you know, oriented Gabors, basically, that uh, you know, at different locations and frequencies and, and orientations. Um, and it's kind of crazy because you're going to apply those filters convolutionally. So you don't need to have different locations of the same filter, right? So when you train convolutionally, you get those filters. And 
the result is that the system doesn't have to spend its, all of its, its energy on shifted versions of the same filter. It just needs one filter at one orientation, you know, maybe another one at different frequency, but it doesn't need to shift it because the shifted version is already present in the convolution. And so the result is that you get much more diverse filters. You get, you know, center surround uh, type filters, you get corner detectors, you get crosses, you get gratings, you get all kinds of stuff. And it would be, uh, it looks wonderful. It would be nice if it actually uh, improved the performance significantly in recognition. Um, and it does in one case. So, so the way we use this is we train this little unsupervised convolutional sparse autoencoder. Okay, we get the filters and we get essentially what amounts to the, the first uh, convolution nonlinearity and pooling of a convolutional net. Then we get rid of the feedback, train the second stage the same way unsupervised, get rid of the feedback, stick a classifier on top, fine tune the whole thing supervised, and uh, that way you can build pedestrian detections that detectors that work really well. So this is a, uh, so by the way, this, these results weren't in the chart that uh, Pietro was showing yesterday. But, uh, so this was CVPR last year. And I mean, this past year, I mean, this 2013. All right. And so the purely supervised convolutional net is this, uh, this line here. So this is uh, false positive per image and miss rate. Okay. So it's like precision recall. And so this is the purely supervised conv net. And this is the conv net that has unsupervised pre training followed by supervised fine tuning. Okay. So it goes from middle of the pack to basically best system at the time of of writing, it's probably not the best anymore. I think there were other papers at CVPR that had uh, similar performance or slightly better. Um, so I don't know if it beats, you know, Piotr's latest uh, pedestrian detector, I'm not sure. Uh, but that makes a difference. Unfortunately, that's pretty much the only application for which it actually makes a significant difference. Uh, so it might be due to, due to the fact that the, the, the training set is very, is relatively small. The label set is very weak. It's only two categories, pedestrian or non-pedestrian. And so the features you get when you do purely supervised training are very degenerate. And unsupervised training makes them less degenerate, I think. Um, OK, it works. Um, so here is a slightly more interesting thing, because this is about invariant features. And I have to stop, huh? OK, so I'll just I'll show uh, cute pictures. Here you go. Oh, environment. It's, it's just, it's just. It's just my question yeah, I mean, it's it's basically a group sparsity on a sparse autoencoder, right? So instead of having L1, you have group L2, right? Okay. All right, and if the groups overlap, uh, so you arrange the components on the two-dimensional uh, topology, and the groups are like this, and they overlap by by half. Uh, you get those, you know, nice organized topology, pinwheel-like patterns. Uh, if you do that without uh, over a uh, you know, with re receptive fields that, that, that vary, you, you actually get those nice pinwheel patterns. You know, these are pinwheel-like. Here's another visualization of it. This is what you find in neuroscience papers, and that's what our system comes up with, or another visualization here. And uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, so, so first of all, it's not really possible to do this because the, uh, the whole thing is trained at once, right? Yeah. So you would have to have, whatever classifier you would have to use would have to be something that you can backpropagate gradient through. Um, you know, which is fine. So, uh, so you could use something, so you know, people, people can ask, you know, could you use an SVM, for example? So you know, essentially the last layer here amounts to a multinomial logistic regression. Basically it's a linear layer with softmax, right? So it's like, Right? But it's trained together with everything else, so you can't really separate it from the rest. Now, if you use uh, you know, a hinge loss instead of the log loss with, uh, you know, with, with softmax, it would be kind of like a multi-class SVM, right? Except it's not an SVM. It's just a linear classifier with hinge loss. So um, that, my guess is that that wouldn't make much of a difference. Jan, how many images, labeled images for image 1.5 million. 1.5 million. And uh, How many years would it take to train a child in that way? 
probably not very long, although you would be surprised by the ImageNet category. So if you look at the 1,000 categories of ImageNet, some of them have pretty obscure breeds of dogs and you know, all kinds of fish species and bird species that uh, I think a child has no way of learning. I'm joking, but I think it's impossible. Right? I, yeah, I think so, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be impossible, but it would take a while. You know, it, it would take... No, but... Right. No, but, but okay, so I, I think that's a big challenge for the next few years. It's to figure out how to do uh, unsupervised training properly. Uh, obviously, huh? Possibly. <laughs> I dodged. Okay, but you can't move. <laughs> Right. Right. So uh, the question is, you know, how much, uh, with, with how many categories do you consider, do you consider it fine grain? Right. Is it above ten thousand or? Oh, oh, it's the restriction. Yeah. yeah okay. So like bird, bird species. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, so I, I don't have a magic bullet for this. Um, in, in the context of this. I mean, I think this can be trained, of course, for fine-grained classification, but um, I, I mean, the, nobody has really tried to uh, take a fine-grained categorization data set that was big enough to, and, and train a system like this on it, perhaps pre-training it on something like ImageNet. So what we find is that when we pre-train on ImageNet and then uh, train with a few examples on something else, like say Pascal or whatever, we get really good performance. So there's re really good transfer learning uh, taking place there. The features, I mean, as you saw in the demo I showed, the features are really good. Um, uh, now, for, for fine grain classification, you probably need to refine them. Uh, the low-level features are going to look exactly the same. The mid-level features probably will be different. Okay, it's all done at NYU, and it does not use the SPJS code. <laughs>